Good morning. Good morning. In case we're wondering. All right, very good. Uh, hey, we'll, we'll welcome the F- FMC Midlothian today. Uh, it's a joy to get to be with you and to share in the opportunity uh, to worship our amazing God. And so thank you for, uh, for joining us today. I'm Pastor Brady Johnston. This is Pastor April Failer. Uh, we're excited that we get to share this uh, w- wonderfully warm July, what is June, June, we're still, we're still in June, uh, Sunday morning with us. It feels like July, doesn't it? I think we can all agree on that one, but um, great to have you with us. So Lori is on vacation today and Jimmy Bass will be playing for us today. So Jim, what's, what was that? Okay, he says, okay. That's, so we're gr- grateful to have you here with us today. And so uh, with that, let's stand and sing together.
All right, let's have prayer together, okay? Um, Father, we are so thankful that you choose to be present with us when we worship you. Uh, what joy there is in, in your presence as we consider who you are and all that you have done. We pray that you continue to guide us and be present with us as we lift up your holy name. Amen. Remain seated. We'll sing Be Still My Soul. Affirmation of faith. Join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, we come to give you thanks and praise. We join with the words of the psalmist who looks to you in the morning in the bright hopes that exist in this day because you are Lord. And so we come to thank you 
for your faithfulness. We come to thank you for your goodness and the grace and the mercy that you have made available to us, that you pour out upon us, though we are often unworthy recipients of your love, you choose out of your nature and character to love. And you call us to be the same as those born anew, sharing in your nature. May we love as you love. May the ministry of our church, Jesus, reflect your heart in your desire of what you want to see done in the community and in the world. And may the sacrifices that we make that are represented by these gifts, may they be pleasing to you and may they go to the work of your kingdom. Amen. Almighty God, you have prepared us for this day. An opportunity to sit amongst our community of faith, to feel the support and encouragement there, to listen to the sounds of the piano and listen for the song of the choir. You've prepared us for this day. The sermon, the prayers, we know that each week we get to come together and praise you and love you and ask for forgiveness as we learn the best ways to glorify you. These are the things that we do on a regular basis. These are the things that you invite us to do all the time. But today, we are prepared to do it. You strengthen us, O oh Lord. You bring us the ability to walk when we don't even know what foot goes first. You give us the ability to take deep breaths 
when sometimes all we can do is barely catch it. You give us the strength to hold ourselves up and our families up and our church up when there are reasons to do so. And Lord, as you have prepared us so well for all of these things, why is it that sometimes we don't listen? Why is it sometimes we don't submit to your will? That indeed there are some times that we don't want to go to church at all. We recognize that your presence is always always with us whether we want to or not. That no matter what ails us, that we can still find healing and recovery in you. And even if we don't know a clear path or a clear way, you still send your light so that we can walk out of the darkness. That there are reasons that are even untold of how magnificent you are and how we were originally built to love you and to be loved by you. And that we are our only barrier to that perfect love, that perfect grace, and that perfect mercy. So even in the most difficult moments, Lord, remind us to lean into our faith. When we are uncertain, lean. When we are scared, lean. That these are the things that you've called us and taught us how to do, to lean. And when we're not strong enough to stand on our own, this is where faith resides. In the leaning, in the counting on you, in the presence of you. We know as disciples, we will continue to make mistakes and we will learn how to get back on course. And we are grateful for an opportunity to say the Lord's Prayer once again to remind us of these things. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
How do you want to be remembered? Hey, last two weeks of David's life have been a bit of a dirge, and so we're going to talk a little bit today about our, our funeral. Uh, yeah, just let's just finish it off, right? Like, just right. It's kind of where we're heading, right, in this story. But, but, but seriously, for a moment, um, I, I want you to think about your funeral, which we hope is, is no time soon. But, but seriously, think about what that is. Your funeral, what do you want people to say about your life? What would you hope that someone stands up here and says about you when they give a testimony about the life that you chose to live day in and day out? What parts of your life you hope that you hope they'll spend a lot of time on? And what parts of your life do you hope that they'll omit? from the story. We all have those, right? But how do you want to be remembered? And I get it. This is an odd and somewhat morbid exercise, but like, it's a fitting question as we think about the power of our legacy. Because we're here at the very end of David's story. This is week lucky number 13, right, of, of our weeks with David's story. We're here At David's end, we will find him today at his deathbed, and we'll look not only at David's last words, but we're going to look back over his life and examine something of his legacy. And David, if you've been with us for these weeks, and you know David has led quite a life. I mean, if you can remember back months ago when we started this story, David was this young shepherd boy. He was a no-name, and even among his family and his brothers, And yet God took this young shepherd and he made him something. And and we see David become this little boy, become a warrior, Israel's warrior. And when he ascends to the throne, Israel is a nation of 12 independent tribes with no sense of unity. But under David, I mean, it becomes a single unified nation. And we see David as a warrior king who goes and fights battles against the enemies, who, who expands the territory. We see him establish a new capital, and that is a place not only of the governance of the nation, but also the place of worship. And we see in David's earlier years when Israel rise to this place of prominence among the other nations. It's an incredible thing. But if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we see that this isn't where things remain. Things take a turn in David's life represented by a sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. David turning against some of his own faithful people. And this leads to a brokenness in David's life. And we see that Absalom, it kind of reaches its pinnacle with Absalom, his son, launching a coup against his father for the throne. And it leaves a nation, even to this moment, battered by the fight within David's own family. They're reeling from that. And I think it's fitting for us for a moment just to step back and to look at David's story. I mean, we've, we've been in it for a while, and if you've been reading in the waypoints, you've gone all the way from 1 Samuel through 2 Samuel at this point, almost this week you will. And as we look back on David's life, we see this pattern emerge for him. And, and I think the pattern is in crisis, David turned to God. But in comfort, David often turned from God. And I realize that's kind of a, a simple way of, of stating this. And, 
And, but we see this, that, that, that David, in, in times of crisis, turned to God, but in times of comfort in his life, he often turned from God. And I think it's worth bringing out because for some of us, we see that same pattern in our own lives. We enter a time of crisis and, and we automatically look toward the Lord for leadership and comfort and care. And part of that is because crisis often brings clarity to our need. When we enter a season of crisis, man, our limitations of the things that we can do and the things that we cannot do become crystal clear. And, and because we know our limitations, it brings up a sense of humility in us. And that humility and that need, man, it drives us to throw our attention towards heaven and to call upon the Lord. But if you look at our story, like times of comfort, those seasons where things are easy, boy, those often lead to a place of spiritual complacency. It leads to the place where there is no real apparent need, where the deeper needs that we're used to kind of ignoring and pushing away, like, like those are no longer readily apparent for us, and we feel like we can just kind of get by on our own, and it leads to a complacency. And that's the breeding grounds for pride. And pride enables us to see the things we want to see in ourselves and ignore the things we'd rather not face. And that's really a part of David's story. We see this in times of crisis. David looked toward the Lord. His heart reached toward the Lord. And David was the best of himself. Just read through his Psalms or you'll read through chapter 22 of 2 Samuel. It's a hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God for his faithfulness. And just read over the images this week of, that David uses for God. They're beautiful images where he talks about God as a refuge and a stronghold, as a fortress in his times of need. And David found God to be that. It's a beautiful thing. Certainly we see in David that one who had a heart for the Lord. Um, and, and yet we're aware and still feeling the effects of the last couple of weeks in David's failures, his faults. Um, by the time we find David today in our scripture in 2 Kings, um, David is on his deathbed. And we find in 2 Kings, or excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 2, jumping way ahead of, of for us here. Uh, but in 1 Kings chapter 2, we find his last words are given to his son Solomon, who's going to take over the throne for David. And, and David's last words to Solomon um, almost perfectly encapsulate his life. Because in David's last words, we see both beauty and brokenness. We see wisdom and foolishness. And you'll see what I mean as we get into them. David, by his life, I think we will look at, and, and even in his last words, he reflects this kind of dueling nature in us, right? This, this capacity for good that seeks to bless and also that shadow side of us that seeks our own good and oftentimes even at the expense of others. And we see this here in David. And so let's turn our attention. If you have your Bible with you, turn to 1 Kings chapter 2. Be looking today at verses 1 through 9. We'll have the words on the screen, as you can see. But man, let our ears be ready to hear these words and consider what God might say to us through them. Um, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. He said, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, he said, so be strong. Act like a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. 
Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. Powerful words of a king to his son. The first thing that David says uh, to his son Solomon is he says, be strong. Which means be of, of good courage because you're going to need it as king. And, and these words might sound really familiar to us because not long ago, well, I guess kind of long ago, six months ago, we, we looked at this story, the book of Joshua. You remember how that book opens? With God speaking to Joshua, who has the, the, the awesome task of following Moses' leadership over God's people. And, and the first thing that God says to him is what? Be strong. Be strong and of great courage. And God speaks into what might be a, otherwise a timidity in, in Joshua, who has to assume the responsibility of God's people. And follow a leader like Moses. And so David follows that same pattern. He says to his son Solomon, who has to step into David's shoes. He says, be strong. Have great courage in your life. And we know in Joshua, the source of strength that I believe for David is as true to David and Solomon as it was what God's saying to Joshua is the source of your strength. And the reason that you can be strong and be courageous and stand in the moment for which you've been raised um, is because I am with you. So have courage. And I wonder in your life right now, where do you need to hear those words? For what place in your life do you need to hear, be strong, have great courage? And there were words that young Solomon needed from his father. David also says to his son, observe what the Lord your God requires, walk in obedience to him. These are powerful words to the one who's about to be king. To walk in obedience. Part of the role of the king that we examined 13 weeks ago when the people started calling for the leadership of a king is that God agreed, even though he didn't like it, he agreed to give the people a king, but the express purpose and role of the king was to represent God's leadership for his people. Can you imagine carrying that responsibility? As the king, you were the agent that reflected the Lord's care for his own people. And, and so God, who desires that his people would flourish gave the king the responsibility of obeying the Lord so that God's blessings that he wants to pour out through his people might come through his chosen vessel, the king. So that the care that God wants to provide will, able to be, will, will be provided by the one who is the king, the reigning person over, over the nation. And it's an incredible thing to think about. Of, of God wanting to care for the people in this way. But boy, it is an awesome responsibility to wear as the king. I mean, it, it sure captures that statement, uh, to whom much is given, much is expected. Here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. The heart of this is the same for you and me. We know Jesus called his followers to a life of obedience. In fact, obedience is one of the markers of discipleship. John 15, 14, Jesus says, You are my friends if you do what I command. Over and over, Jesus emphasizes the need for obedience. Why? Because Jesus wants to bless the world. In the same way the Father loved his people and wanted to bless and lead his people and chose to do that through a vessel in the king, 
So Jesus wants to bless the world through you and through me. That we are, and we might argue is not a great choice, but it's his choice. We are the vessels through which God wants to pour out his blessings into the world. And that's an awesome responsibility to be called to be a part of of his work in the world. But if we're to do this, if we're to be the agents of God's blessing, we have to be obedient, just like the king. We have to be servants who say yes to you, God, and what you call us to do. Obedience is is a part of belonging to the plans of Jesus and the world, which are, which are an awesome thing to be a part of. It's an amazing thing to consider that, that Jesus and all that he's done for us invites you and me to be a part of his work in the world. And part of what I love about that in the number of parables that we've looked at before when parables that talk about Jesus' invitation to be a part of his ministry and life is that Jesus says, man, when you share in my work, you also share in my joy. So when you say yes to me, when you may hear my commands and you look at my will and you realize it's not your will and not what you would choose to do, but you say yes anyways, man, there is joy for you. Because you're part of an eternal work. You get to be a vessel through which, through which God works and channels his love and blessings through. And Jesus says there's no greater life than that. There's no greater existence than that of being a servant of God and sharing in the joy of the master as we see his love transform lives around us. But it begins with us saying yes. Yes, we will walk in obedience to you so that we can be an agent of blessing for the world. And there's a part of of this call to obedience that is indeed a blessing to you, but it's not just a blessing to you. It's a blessing to all those around you. And while David and now Solomon may wear a very specific responsibility as king of Israel with more weight on their shoulders than you and I could imagine and certainly want, we have that same call to obedience. If you're hoping for really encouraging words, that, that was it. Um, that... that just keep reading those, those verses because um, you get into the second half and things take a turn. And, and we see David move from that, that beautiful heart that pursues and wants and longs for the things of God that says yes to God. I'll be obedient and faithful. Um, and what we begin to see here is bitterness. And, and David will shift in his last words. It's last words, last spoken words. And he will ask his son to settle his old scores. In fact, he'll essentially hand Solomon, who's about to be king, a hit list. Let's look in verse 5. Now Solomon, you yourself know what Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to me. What he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime, as if in battle. And with that blood, he stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. Message received. (laughs) David orders a hit on Joab, who was his longtime commanding officer in his army. Someone who'd served David faithfully for years. And if you're with us, you might remember the name Joab, and it shows up a few times in David's story at some significant points. And 
You might ask, well, what did Joab do that was wrong to deserve a a hit on his life here at the end of David's life? Well, Joab was a faithful commander of David's, but we see that as David as a king, as he began to get older, started to neglect his role of being the king who led his people out in battle. And he gave those responsibilities and that power to Joab. And the more that Joab had that power and authority, the more he began to win influence with the people, especially with the army. And the more influence and more power that Joab gained, the more he began to act independently of the will of the king. And it kind of reaches a crisis point when Absalom takes on his father and they go into battle and David gives Joab express orders not to kill Absalom, but to protect him. And what does Joab do when the moment seizes him? He kills Absalom. And when David gives orders in the midst of peacetime, as he's alluded to here, to partner with other commanding officers in Israel's army, Joab kills them. And so we see David here orders a hit on Joab. That's the only way he can seem to resolve this. But the the frustrating thing uh, about this, this order here is that David had countless opportunities to deal with Joab himself. Joab lived in the palace with David. And so he had opportunity after opportunity to deal with this and to bring resolution to whatever grievances and frustrations that he had with Joab. But David did none of that. Instead, he just passes the responsibility on to his son Solomon. We see the next hit in verse 8. He says, And remember, you have with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahruim, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahanaim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now, do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. 2 Samuel 16 is a story that David is referring to here. And it's once Absalom launches his coup against David, David flees Jerusalem along with his family. And as he does, Shimei begins to launch curses and rocks and dirt at David, believing that, that Dave, this rebellion against David is an is a end to his kingdom and the beginning of the reign of Absalom, something that Shimei believes is of God. And so he hurls the curses. And what's interesting is that in the moment of brokenness and fear, even though David's warriors want to kill Shimei, David has them stand down. In chapter 19, after Absalom is killed and the coup comes to an end, Shimei actually comes to David and asks for his forgiveness. He says, surely I was wrong. God wants to work through you and your reign. So he asks for forgiveness, and David gives it to him. David forgives Shimei, and it seems like everything is good until this moment where David seems to forget his oath. Well, I guess he actually remembers his oath. But he remembers Shimei's sins more than he does a commitment. And so he follows a, a loophole, seeks a loophole to end Shimei's life. This, like the last words of David, man. I, I, it, uh, this, this hit on two people. What are we to make of this? I think part of what we see here is this pattern that we see in David's life of of never seeking uh, reconciliation or resolution to the issues and challenges in his relationships. He never does. David never has the hard conversations. David's never the one to try and deal with something when a problem arises. He just pushes it away and he pretends as if it's just going to resolve itself 
as if it's not a big deal. And he pushes it away and pushes it away and he holds it away. And in the busyness of life, these grudges are, are not at the forefront of his mind. And so maybe he's convinced himself that it doesn't really need to be dealt with, that the hard conversation doesn't need to be had. But here's the thing. It shows up in the end. It shows up in the end. And it shows up in, in the end as in the form of a regret of David refusing to do the thing that he knew he needed to do. It shows up as something he regrets. Now, there's a, a lesson here for us. And it's when we fail to seek resolution, we will have regrets. Regrets stem from the resolution that we do not seek and the hard conversations we choose to not have. When we know there's something right to pursue and yet we don't do it. And it's easy in much of our life to convince ourselves we don't need to have the hard conversation. We don't need to deal with that. It's someone else's responsibility to make the first move toward us because they hurt us. Like it's easy to convince ourselves and it's easy sometimes to go day by day and not think about some of those things. But we see for David in his life, these things, these conversations he puts off, these responsibilities he has that he pushes by the wayside and just ignores, they come back to haunt him in the end so that on his deathbed, he's not saying the things you want to say to those you love. Instead, like his last, like the second to last word he says is hell. Do his like, send him to hell is what he says. That's bitterness that consumes David's heart. And he was in many ways this man after God's own heart, but we see the worst of him kind of take over at times in his life. And I don't think we can look at David's words without considering our own story. And we know how easy it is to not have the conversations we know we probably should have. And how easy it is to push off the opportunities by which we should be seeking some reconciliation, or at least some kind of re resolution. And, and I grew up in a denomination that asked this just about every day, so forgive me for this, but let me ask you, man, if you were to die tomorrow, what would be your regret? I've already thought about our funerals, all right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you found yourself on your deathbed tomorrow, what would be your regret? What hard conversation that you didn't have would you like to have gone back and actually had? What hard thing that you didn't do would you wish you could go back and actually do? And I'm, and I'm not talking about your regrets in the form of I didn't get to see the Grand Canyon like that. That's a certain level of regret, all right? But I'm talking about the real regrets that are going to haunt you in the last moments. The ones around your relationships. The ones that if you're honest about what you're pushing back, they matter to you, mean something to you. Those aren't the things you want to show up at the end, and they're not. And peace comes to us in the end when we lay all our cards on the table. And we know sometimes in our, in our relationships, man, reconciliation isn't possible, but don't let it not be possible because we weren't the ones that didn't make that call. Don't make it not a possibility because we were the ones that held back and said, the, the move is theirs first. None of us in this room want to listen and, and live with regrets in our life. They consume David and leave him in bitterness at the end. We don't want to follow that pattern in our lives. And peace comes when we lay all our cards on the table. Or even if reconciliation isn't possible, at least we sought resolution. At least we had courage. And at least we 
did the right thing. I think we have to ask ourselves at this point, the very end of David's life, what in the world are we to make of David's life? (laughs) Man, it has been a roller coaster of wonderful highs and low lows. And I think in many ways, David represents the best of us and also the worst of us. And I think what we see in David's life is that while he was the king that people wanted, he was ultimately not the king that they needed. As great as David was, and he will be the the shining example of a king for Israel. For all his brokenness and failures, David's the one whose name is held up as that ideal king. Even amidst the broken legacy, he's the name that they look at. And as we look through the Old Testament, we see that even though David was this one who was regarded for all his failures, like, like it leads to this idea of a need for something more. As great as he was, they needed something more. And that king that they needed would come to them much later. Not riding on a horse as a warrior, but on a donkey. And to that same capital city and place of worship, he would show himself to be a king. Not by the blood of his enemies that he spilled, but in the spilling of his own blood as a servant to the people. We see this broken legacy of David that we might grieve at the end of his story, be redeemed through this one Jesus who was sent, who came to fulfill the greatest human need that David and any king, any person is unable to do. And how grateful we are for this Jesus who comes to redeem not only David's legacy, but but who can redeem ours. Who can lead to real peace in our lives. Strip away the bitterness and lead us and call us to reconciliation as difficult and bold as that move might be for us. As we close the sermon, we'll open the, the altar here if you want to be in prayer for for someone or, or for yourself or maybe a relationship in your life. Maybe you need to pray for courage because you, you know well who, what call needs to be made. What regret needs to be righted before it's too late. And so we invite you to come and, and pray as we begin to close. Jesus, we thank you that you are the king that we needed and you are the king that came into our world and into our lives. The one who showed us what it truly means to pursue the heart of God, to say yes in every moment and seek to be obedient so that your father might pour out his love and blessings through your life. Jesus, you are the model in every way of who and what we are called to be. And you are the one who called us to be reconcilers, to be those who seek to bring resolution to the brokenness and relationships that exist in and around our lives. And you, are the, you know the cost of that. You know how hard it is for us. And yet it was your very ministry where you came that we might be reconciled to our Father in heaven. We thank you for making that first move, for demonstrating the love of the Father for us by dying for us, while, as Paul says in Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners. We pray that you would lead us that we would hear your commands anew and afresh with our ears and that we might have the courage and strength to simply say yes, knowing that your grace is sufficient to see us through that obedience. Because, God, we want our lives to bless. 
We don't want to fall prey to bitterness at the end. We want our lives to be a blessing, to continue to speak, not just at our funerals, but far beyond. We want a legacy of blessing. And so lead us. We pray this, Jesus, in your awesome name. Amen. I invite you to stand and let us sing together. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, what a joy it's been to gather in worship. And Joe and Jimmy, we thank y'all for, for leading us here today. And yeah, it deserves a, a clap. Um, just a couple announcements. One, we have a music camp coming up at, towards the end of the month, uh, so be sure. We, have, we still need some servants to be there. Um, music camp's a great opportunity to invest in, in children in our community. We had a number of families that came from out of the community last year, and um, some that continued to come to the church and, and out of that. And so it's a great opportunity to minister. Um, just in case you're going, is there 300 kids here like at VBS? I was 30, so like it's a manageable number. Uh, so it's a great way. We'd love for you. You don't have to have musical ability to serve at that, but it's going to be a great week, and so I encourage you to do that. Uh, we do have our, our Methodist movement um, class or group, whatever we call it. Uh, it's going to be over there in the Family Life Center after this. You're welcome to join us, grab some coffee and donuts, and um, sit down. Uh, this is the first Sunday of our youth and children, Sunday school leaders, uh, kind of having a, a break for the month so, uh, to be re ready for the, the school year, which is coming up far quicker than we could imagine. So um, just be aware of that. Um, it's been a blessing to be here with you. If you're a first-time guest, we have, uh, would love to bless you with something in the back. And so um, go see Miss Patty, and we'd love to, to share with you. She's got the purple shirt on. So um, uh, also, as we get ready to leave this place, we've looked at the life of David, and I pray we've, we've learned, been challenged, been blessed, uh, been warned at times, right, through his life. Um, and may we hear his last words and look into our own hearts and lives. Uh, let us be those who say yes in obedience to Jesus and by his grace and mercy do the hard but necessary and ultimately good things. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we go. Amen.